So, I can't pronounce this, but the future of fundraising. I want today to answer these questions. Are we facing a golden age of fundraising, or is our future just going to be managing decline? These are very, very real questions for everybody in the UK, and I will explain to you why. It's 2017. The crisis that hit British fundraising happened in 2015, and in all of my 41 years, I have never seen anything like it. So I know that some of you thought this couldn't happen here in, in Netherlands. I, I, I don't know if that's the case or not. I don't know your market well enough. But we would not have said it could happen in Britain. And it happened, and it was catastrophic. But now we are at a crossroads. And the question that is facing us is what direction will fundraisers take? Are they going to go the right way or are they going to go the wrong way? So what I'm going to do today, as Zenka mentioned, is in four parts. I'm going to talk about the writing on the wall, where we went wrong and why fundraising really has to change. Then there will be a coffee break. Why is change so difficult? What can we do to make sure that we get it right and that we will, we will win this particular challenge? Then there will be lunch. I then want to focus on two of the 28 projects that Zenka mentioned, uh, particularly about major donors and emotion, and look at things like service, inspiration, storytelling, and some of the new tools that actually have come into prominence more recently in terms of building an effective donor experience. Then there will be tea break, because this is British and you know, we like a cup of tea uh, in the afternoon. And then I'm going to try and bring it all together and define the key changes that, that uh, can happen and how we will make them stick. So I hope you're all right with that. I haven't got anything else. So, <laughs> um, but, well, actually, I do have something else. I have the, what I think is the most important ingredient of today to share with you. I want to share with you at least 32 what I call tr transformational light bulb moments. These are, I'll explain just a little bit what I mean by light bulb moments. I've put a background of a wall to set the scene. I want to talk about the writing on the wall because the writing on the wall for our crisis was around a long time before the crisis hit. Now, if I had a wall to write on and the opportunity to say what I think about fundraising, I would write something like this. I love fundraising. I think fundraising has enormous potential for social good. I think fundraising has the potential for joy, for making a difference, for giving people fulfillment and a sense of achievement while they do something which makes the world a better place. And that's how I would write on the wall. But in 2015, the UK fundraising scene was set on its head by this. Many of you, I'm sure, will, have, will know of this story, but some of you perhaps don't. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time. But what kicked off this particular catastrophe was the story of a lady called Olive Cook, who was a serial supporter of charities. She was Britain's oldest poppy seller. And in May of 2015, she took her own life by jumping off a bridge. And the headline that The Sun and The Daily Mail and lots of other sensationalist newspapers ran was that she was killed, hounded to her death by the charities that she had supported. Now, later on, her family said that wasn't the case, that actually Olive suffered depression and killed herself for a whole variety of other reasons, but that actually she got a great deal of comfort from the charities that she supported. But by that time, the genie was out of the bottle, and it did emerge that Olive was receiving something like 10 fundraising appeals, what the Sun and the Daily Mail call begging letters from people like us. 
And it went on. And it went on, and it went on, and it went on, and it's still going on. Two years later, the press still has charities in their sights. The floodgates opened, and we had a catastrophe, the implosion of UK fundraising. And it has not cost us hundreds of thousands of pounds. It's not cost us millions of pounds. It's cost us hundreds of millions of pounds and such distress. And so many people have left the sector because they couldn't bear the reactions they got from the public when they said, I'm a fundraiser. And I think fundraisers have often said when they meet people at parties, oh, I'm in public relations or I'm in communication or I'm in marketing or whatever, anything but tell people I'm a fundraiser and I'm proud to be a fundraiser. But now, in the UK, that had changed, and it had changed forever. And it was because of this that we let, launched the Commission on the Donor Experience, which was a deliberate attempt to put the donor back at the heart of fundraising rather than the financial targets which had taken, taken over. So. 18 months at least of sustained attacks. It's actually longer than that. Uh, this is an example of the kind of story that was running in the press. This is the story of a man called Samuel Ray, and it talks about individual charities who were named and shamed con constantly. <laughs> I was asked to be a spokesman for the government-appointed um, Etherington Commission, which was set up by a panicking government to review what changes fundraising needed, needed to make. And I appeared on television, and under my uh, caption was, was the words, former director of fundraising at Action Aid. And I said to the people who were setting up the interview, I said, that was in 1984. You know, I haven't been a head of fundraising. But I said, why can't you get somebody more recent? And they said, oh, we've tried. Nobody would come. And people put their heads down. The media pressure was so intense. The people in your jobs in the UK were likely to find themselves on the front page of the national press. Several of people I know well did. And it was stories like this, the relentless hounding, the selling of data, the persistence, the over high pressure techniques. I just want you to note this. Stuart Etherington, who produced that report I mentioned, saying, we've got, after the male's exposure, charities know they've got to change and completely overhaul their relationship with supporters. Now, I don't think the male behaved well I don't think the media comes out of this terribly well at all. But they maybe did our sector a favor, because for me, Olive Cook should be the patron saint of fundraising, because she, as the canary in the coal mine, has given us a chance to get our act together. So just quickly running through what the problems are, a target-driven culture. Fundraisers just want the money. Short-term thinking. Donors taken for granted. Ever more asking. Cheapest is best. Lowest cost. Hang the quality. No questions will be asked. Now, I know not all organizations are like that. There are plenty of very good fundraisers. Most fundraising in Britain, I think, is exemplary. But there are far too many that follow this. And they're damaging things for the rest of us. And it's not just to do with the fundraising organization. It is to do with the whole organization, uh, disconnected boards and poor leadership. Inept induction and training, the wrong people doing the wrong things in the wrong ways. And this has led to unhappy donors feeling pressurized and unappreciated. So I want to start fixing on the solutions, the kind of things that the Commission on the Donor Experience has come up with is to try and improve that experience. We started with the principles and integrity. There is a document, which I think is going to be made available to everybody from this conference, called the six Ps. And it's for the, the six. I'll, I'll come to it later and go into it in detail. It's about getting the right people in, in place and equipping them properly and leading them well. 
What the Commission set out to do was to document the best practice of donor-focused fundraising and to make it freely available for everybody on the basis that there's a lot of good things going on and we need to make sure they are in the ascendancy and the wrong ways of doing things are not possible. So I will end this session uh, at the end of today talking about how we will make a new commitment to our donors that things from now on will be different. But we have had imposed upon us a new fundraising regulator. We have been told we have to change. And really, our sector has been given no choice but to change. Uh, we still talk about uh, the fact that uh, we're self-regulating, but it is just not true anymore. It's just not true anymore. So I want you to look at these people. I want you to look them in the eye. They're all looking directly at you. And I just want you to think about these people that we exist to help. The downtrodden and the needy, the desperate, the poor, the aged, the infirm, the sick. I think in my country, fundraising let these people down really badly. I think what we need to focus on is how we can stop that happening again. That's what today is about. So it's a huge crisis. What could fundraisers do? Well, there's a significant body of people in the UK, even today, who think we should do nothing. It'll pass. Business as usual. Let's keep going. I'll show you more about that because I think this is an endemic issue within our organizations that we do have to tackle, we have to face up to.